Good morning, folks. I decided to add a example, a very specific example of how to hook up the keypads to the to the big board. So the pick target board uh, page now has on it a DAC DDS example and a keypad example. And if if I if I turned off the lights, you could actually see these, but but you can look at them at your leisure. Shows how to hook up the the keypad to the to the big board, and then there's a picture of my thumb pressing the number seven, and there's a seven on the liquid crystal display. So this is just to demonstrate that it actually works. The timing is a little close. The, the sequence of pulses which is put out by the keyboard scanner as I wrote it is about 500 nanoseconds. So it's, it's scanning the keypad very quickly. If you have long enough wires here or the capacitance of this board is high enough, it won't work. So you have to put in a very small delay so if you're getting erratic results, talk to me. I'll show you how to put in a, a small delay, where small means one microsecond. Can't do it in software. You have, to, you have to do it actually in assembly language. But it's not hard in assembly. So new example there of, a, of keypad that you might be interested in for lab two. But right now, what questions do you have on homework two? I've gotten all kinds of interesting comments about homework too. So what do you want to know about this? Some people found these these MATLAB outputs obscure, but remember that, and I, and I plotted one cycle per window uh, in MATLAB units that happen to be a cycle per second, and you say, wait, 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 I've got to do a thousand cycles per second. How does this relate to me? Well, the frequency scales. If you, if you set the fundamental to one, and the sample frequency is 30 times, 32 times, or 8 times higher, which is what I have here, you can't tell whether that's 1 hertz or 1 kilohertz. You just change the scale. It looks the same. So the, the code scales with frequency, so why not use unit frequency? So all that matters, all that matters for this analysis is the number of DDS samples per cycle. And if you make it work at the highest frequency, which is 6 kilohertz, if you make it work at, at 6 kilohertz, if you make the signal to noise ratio good enough at 6 kilohertz, it clearly will be better at every frequency below 6 kilohertz because there will be more samples per cycle. So I'm not, I'm not looking for a lot of analysis. I'm not looking for you to figure out how to do sine over x interpolation of, of minimal sample frequency waveforms. I want you to oversample this so that it's easy. You oversample it. Anybody picked the sample frequency yet? Uh, 96. 96 kilohertz. Why don't I just go for 100 and make it a round number? Yeah, all right. Let me. But 96 is reasonable. Yeah. No questions on the homework. Wow. That's disturbing. Yes? Can you talk more about the amplitude modulation? Amplitude modulation. So, you're going to have to, 
ramp up rather than draw it. I think I have a picture of it here on lab two if I can hit. Oh, I'm in lab. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do is to take the sine wave that you're synthesizing at constant amplitude and then multiply it by a number between 0 and 1 to produce some sort of modulation from 0 to full amplitude in about 4 milliseconds. Why 4 milliseconds? Hmm. 4 milliseconds, reciprocal of 4 milliseconds would be um, 250 hertz. That's pretty low frequency. It won't uh, interfere with the it, it gives you at a thousand Hertz which is the minimum frequency it's going to give you at least four or five cycles on the rising time that's enough to avoid a click so the shape of this I'm not too concerned about almost any shape other than an instantaneous turn on if you do an instantaneous turn on turn off so you're going from zero to full power you'll get a brutal click because of the the Fourier components at high frequency that are in inferred by having a sharp onset and offset <laughs> but any reasonable shape here with finite rise time of, a of about four milliseconds will suppress the click if you really want to do it up you make sure all the non all of the derivatives are continuous this has a discontinuous first derivative because it goes from finite slope to zero slope that'll make a little bit of a click but not much any discontinuity in slope makes an artifact in Fourier domain but the more gradual you make this slope the smaller the artifact, the lower the frequency. If you made that slope 100 milliseconds, you wouldn't hear any artifact because it would be below your hearing. It would be at 10 hertz or so. That seems a little extreme. Is that enough? Or are you asking how to do the arithmetic? There's at least three ways of doing the arithmetic. The most obvious thing people are going to do is say, oh, a number between 0 and 1, floating point. So floating point takes 30 or 40, maybe 50 cycles on this architecture to do a multiply because it's simulated floating point in software. If you do a integer multiply, it'll take two cycles, instantaneous essentially. Another possibility is to do fixed point multiplies, in which case you could specify a fraction and it takes about uh, 12 cycles or so. I would think for the purposes of this lab, if you're going to do a, a slope, that you could probably do a variant on fixed point. Let's say you want to multiply by a number between 0 and 1 and we're going to make it, let's say we want to do it in 256 steps, so we're going to scale this 0 to 255, then you could take your amplitude of the, of the, of the sine wave, which remember is going to be off, if you go from the table, it's plus minus 2048, right? It's already a large integer, plus minus 2048. Take the amp, multiply by 250, multiply by the, let's call this now the uh, modulation here, multiply by the modulation and divide by 256. So this is an integer, multiply, 
an integer times an integer divided by an integer. So this gives you a way of making a fraction between 0 and 1 times the amplitude of the sine wave. Oh, but multiply is slow on this architecture because, it, it, because it's, it's a successive approximation, successive subtraction. So it's really much better to take this whole thing and do a shift by 8 bits which is one cycle. So by the time you get done encoding it, it doesn't look like multiplying by a fraction, it looks like something else, but it is in fact multiplying by a fraction between 0, 256 and 255, 256. So that's one way of doing it. I wasn't going to talk about full fixed point arithmetic just at this point. I was before the next lab. Do you want to hear about fixed point arithmetic right now? Nah. Yes? No? No op? Who cares? Okay. Well, since there's no opinion, let's go on and talk about a little bit more about the bottom end of the synthesis. We've been talking about direct digital synthesis, making a sine wave. The sine wave samples have to be offset and, if I can remember where I put this, have to be offset and manipulated a little bit to to output so in the interrupt service routine all the synthesis is going to be done in the interrupt service routine the modulation has to be done in the ISR because it has to be per sample right so modulation is going to be done in the interrupt service routine but last time when I talked I kind of said we're gonna do we're going to do the direct digital synthesis, we're going to do the phase accumulation, we're going to do the table lookup, and then magic happens and, and, and the voltage comes out. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the low end of this, which is the serial peripheral interface connection to the DAC. So Serial peripheral interface is a protocol. So SPI, serial peripheral interface, is a protocol which is a full duplex, three wire, and address is by chip select. Full duplex means that you transmit and receive at the same time. In fact, you have to. The way you receive is the transmit. And three wire means that there is a, a data out, an SDO line. There is a SDI line and there is a clock. It is synchronous. Mm -hmm. It is a synchronous protocol addressed by chip select. Mm -hmm. the wiring scheme which has been done for you on the big board but you may want to have more devices than are on the big board looks uh, like this there's an SPI master which in our case will be the PIC 32 And any number of so-called slave devices which are going to be connected so that SD out goes to each of the slaves 
SDI is data coming from each of the slaves and the clock line the clock is distributed to each of the slaves furthermore there is a separate chip select CS1 chip select 1 which is which tells the slave 1 that it is being addressed and a chip select 2 which tells slave 2 that it is being addressed clearly it is a bad idea to to lower both these are actually active low chips select 1 and 2 are low active low it is a bad idea to lower both these signals at the same time because then both slaves will drive their output port which are connected together so you don't ever want to do that the protocol is extremely simple and therefore simultaneously easy to implement and somewhat annoying but SDO and SDI are simultaneously active when the master loads the transmit buffer when you drop a word byte or short selectable inch short or byte when you drop one of those three into the transmit register the the transmit starts the clock starts and data is is pumped across this line to the slave and at the same moment on the same clock edges data is pumped from the slave back to the master so you always have a bi-directional uh, communication whether you like it or not for instance with a DAC there is no data coming back you're loading the voltages out to the DAC you're never reading the channel but there's always data there to read For some memories, you have to send it an address and then do another transaction to get the data back. Yes? Oh, you can finish off the last Go ahead. Uh, the data that you're transmitting through the transfer register, is that the most significant bit first or least? Oh, so the question is, is it most significant bit or least significant bit? You could choose that. So you can also choose the phase of the data relative to the clock so you could say is the, is the data valid on clock high is it valid on clock low is it valid on the edge or is it valid on the level and so every and the, and the hard part of this is not this is easy that's a, this this hookup is very easy this hookup is very easy the hard part is reading the data sheet to figure out what the device actually does that you're going to connect to the master because every single vendor has a different name for everything because standards are good everybody should have one and because every one of these slaves of which the DAC is one is itself a complicated state machine and you have to give commands to the state machine and every single chip is different so the pinout is easy we have a we have a two voltages out it's a two-channel DAC 
out A and out B. On, on, on the big board, it's called DACA and DACB on the edge connector. There's a ground connection and a VDD. There's a chip select, which is part of the protocol and has to be manipulated. When you drop chip select, the, the excuse me, when you, when you drop chip select, the DAC knows that it should expect exactly 16 clocks. 16 clock pulses corresponding to 16 bits of data. There's S clock, there's SD in, which you connect to SD out from the master. Uh, and an, a, something called LDAC, which really is um, a load command for the, to, so that if you wanted to load A then B and have them change at the same time at the output, you could drop that and both voltages would appear at the same instant at the output of the DAC. But we just tied it low because I don't care within one cycle. So this is physically what the chip looks like, but what you really care about is what is it logically? And from the standpoint of the SPI master, what it looks like logically after we go down through all the quality control and timing data, every SPI device someplace will have a spin description and then a protocol description. And the protocol description then goes over into serial interface. This is the part you have to read and memorize whenever you start a new serial device. Uh, here are the right command register for the various devices. And the, the detail of interest is for the 16 bits you're going to transmit in one SPI packet, for the 16 bits you're going to transmit, what are the 16 bits? The first one is, are you going to write A or B? 14 is don't care. 13 is gain selection. I haven't played with this. I leave it locked at 1 because 0 to 2 volts is about right for our architecture. Shut down control bit. If you want to turn it off, you can do that. And then bits of 0 through 11 are the voltage. So what you're going to send is a 12-bit number, which is exactly proportional to the voltage out you want between 0 and 2.048 volts. So it's one millivolt per step. So now, given that, we can go back and look at this example and sort of expand out that, that uh, code a little bit. <clears throat> what we're going to do, I chose to use port B bit 4 as chip select that happens to be how it is wired on the big board. So I'm going to clear bit 4. That signals the beginning of a transaction. So this is chip select. Then I could have waited to see if the buffer is full, but I'm not because I'm checking it after the write. So we clear the bit, and then we write to SPI2. The DAC data, which remember is plus or minus 2048, 2047, plus 2048, so it is always the number between 0 and 4096. We wait until the, we wait until the transaction is done. We wait until the SPI status bits are no longer signaling busy, then we raise the chip select line. If we do not wait, but rather do the right, 
and then immediately raise the chip select line, one or two or three bits will get sent, chip select line will go high, and the transaction is terminated from the standpoint of the DAC. Because this is not synchronous. This is throwing a word, it's throwing 16 bits into the register and returning. So you're going to wait, then end the transaction. And when you end the transaction, the voltage will appear on the pin of the DAC. And you could do that for stereo. You could do that for each channel. You have to do a separate transaction for each, for each uh, channel. But it's pretty easy to use. It's fast. You can clock the DAC up to the SPI channel up to about 20 megabits per second so that you can output an, a 16-bit word in about three quarters of a microsecond. That means that it is not worth spinning this off into a separate interrupt service routine or doing anything other than just waiting for it to be done. You don't try and do anything fancy here. You're not, you're not trying to unblock a thread. You're not trying to do anything because there's not enough time. However, you might be able to get clever for some, for some systems that require a lot of computation, let's say modulation co a computation. You could put the modulation computation between the write and the check busy and it might be finished by the time that the check busy is is checked and so you would have effectively hidden the cost of calculation of the modulation in the SPI transfer time because this is hardware folks when this starts to write it is hardware doing it, it is not software and so you can interpolate software between these two lines to save time if you need it. You won't in this lab, but you will in lab three. <laughs> so, Questions about direct digital synthesis from last week. There are there are DDS synthesizer chips. Analog Devices makes one which has a lookup table of 2 to the 14th sine wave values scattered over uh, a quarter of a cycle. And it synthesizes the whole waveform as you step through the table. It's, it synthesizes the whole waveform by, by, by figuring out which quadrant you're in and doing the appropriate uh, sign flipping and it interpolates between samples for an effective resolution of 2 to the 32 steps. That's a lot of steps. Furthermore, it clocks at, um, I think, 5 gigahertz. So you can, you can do some really gorgeous synthesis with, with this chip. We're going to limit to a, a, a table size of 256 and I am not asking you to interpolate between samples so you're going to have a table size of 256 
which means that you will have a amplitude quantization of 8 bits it's good enough to get this, the, the distortion down to where you need it you could fairly easily write a linear interpolation routine which would get you another couple of bits of signal to noise ratio I'm not asking you to do that but I may do that out of idle curiosity to see how how what it does to the signal to noise ratio questions on DDS Right. Do I, I see something Actually, going on? I, here. I guess I do. I have a <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, come on. Yeah, speak up. So, so like, wouldn't wouldn't interpolation be done with like, on the DAC, right? Because the DAC just holds whatever you give it. So. So no matter what, what you get like that. This <laughs> So there's, there's actually two sampling. There's amplitude sampling, which says I'm not going to be able to set this to an arbitrary amplitude because there's only 256 amplitudes in the table. There's also time sampling, which says I'm only going to set the amplitude at a certain number of finite times. But I could make this amplitude variable in here to interpolate. So, so there are two separate samplings, both of which matter for the distortion, but in quite different ways. What other questions? So one experiment you can do is take my code. It does DDS, no modulation. Turn up the clock until it breaks. What's my code set to? Hmm. It's set to it's set to the the timer interrupt that's running this is set to 200 cycles. So that's about 200 kilosamples per second. Drop the number of cycles. See where it breaks. I believe that this will break sometime around 70 or so cycles. There, in the interrupt service routine, there's a stub which I didn't use in this code, but you'll notice it says ISR time read timer 2. That's going to give the time since the interrupt service routine flag was set because at that point timer 2 is zeroed by hardware. Timer counts up to 200 gets reset to zero. Counts up to 200 gets reset to zero. When it takes the hardware event it resets the timer to zero so by the time it gets here we can read how many cycles did it take to get into the interrupt service routine plus execute this code if I took the same statement and put it at the beginning of the interrupt service routine I could find out how many cycles it takes <coughs> to get to this point in other words just entering the interrupt service routine I did that it's 74 cycles to get in What's it doing for 75 cycles? <laughs> Pushing 32 registers onto the stack. So, questions on DDS, questions on reading the keypad. Do you want me to go through the DDS arithmetic again?
Folks, homework's due tomorrow. Okay, well, so what details might we go into here? Oh yes, there's a, there's a couple of more SPI examples you could be interested in. The there's a whole page here on ser serial peripheral interface. Uh, framed SPI, you're going to care about for lab three, but not for this lab. And the hypothesis here is that it's annoying to have software. You know, since I can just jam a word into the SPI transmit register and it transmits, why should I separately have to set a chip select line? Why, why shouldn't jamming a word into the, into the transmit register also throw a chip select line low and completely automate that in hardware for me? And framed SPI is that feature. It allows you to put your, your chip select line in hardware which you're going to need for lab three. But uh, another example uses two devices on the same SPI channel. It uses the DAC and also separately a serial RAM which is really nice. It allows you to put up to this one megabit serial RAM allows you to organize about 128 8 bit words as off chip memory. So if you have an application for a final project that needs lots of memory, let's say you need to store an image, let's say you need to store a ton of sound samples, you could put it on an external chip, these cost like a buck and a half give you a megabit of memory and run with only three wire connection to the uh, CPU. They'll run at about a microsecond per word. It is not brutally fast, but it's fast enough for audio synthesis for sure and probably for animation and for a lot of image synthesis. So it's a good place to store, mem uh, to store uh, a lot of samples. <coughs> and so to make sure I understood how to make this all work, I built a, a, a code that combined them. It takes one word out of, uh, out of uh, the memory and puts it onto the DAC. It's kind of a boring example. But uh, it gave me a chance to build up uh, a library of, of routines. We're setting up an SPI channel. These are the next, uh, then there's all of the commands for the, for the RAM and because it is another integrated circuit with another SPI state machine, it itself has a set of internal commands that you use to control it. The DAC we just talked about it has a set of internal commands that, it's used, that are used to control it. And because the DAC is 8 bits and the, the DAC data is 8 bits, the DAC address is 16 bits and the, no I'm sorry, the DAC data is 16 bits the RAM data is 8 bits, the RAM address is 16 bits, we have to be able to dynamically control the data width of the SPI. So these are three inlines to control whether it's 16, 8, or 32 bits per transaction. Then there's a whole bunch of material here to 
to write RAM arrays, read uh, arrays, and then finally a command thread that, that, uh, that uses this stuff. The command thread is written assuming that you have a console connection to the, to the PIC32. We can do that. You can hook up a transmit and receive line to the UART, hook it to the PC, and get a console window that you can control. I decided not to do that for most of the labs this year for a number of reasons, one of which is the dongles that do the connection disappear at a frightening rate. So. They're $15 each. We lost 50 of them last year. You know, it starts to add up. So, so you could do console read-write, but you have to want to. And the net effect is that by manipulating, by ni manipulating chip select lines and data width of the SPI channel, you can control two completely separate devices with separate st internal state machines across the SPI channel. In fact, you can, you can manipulate at least six or seven on an SPI channel. The current in in incarnation of the big board has the TFT, liquid crystal display, and the port expander sharing a port and the DAC on a separate port, I think. Let's just check that. So, The DAC, the DAC is on RB5 and RB15 for data and clock. The, the liquid crystal display is on RB14. And the port expander is on RB5. So that's the, that's a, yes, the chip expander and the, no, oh, the chip expander and the, and the DAC are, are, are sharing a, a, a channel and the TFT has its own channel. So any questions on lab two? So, final project, initial description, will be due in the week three of lab three is homework five. So, which amusingly comes, is due before homework four. And uh, <clears throat> because it refers to the lab exercise number rather than linear time. But that means that in the next lab, by the end of the next lab, you have to know what you're going to make for a final project. So that's only, what, four weeks away? So it's time to, time to start thinking about this. So what are you thinking? Any ideas? Have you looked at the, have you looked at the project page? Yes, hopefully you, hopefully you have. Because there's a, there's a lot of good ideas there. But 
and someplace here I had a few random ideas. I can't even remember how, how when I last messed with this, so some of it may be obsolete. A sun tracker, always in good taste. Solar powered ultraviolet detector with sunburn warning. I could use that. Solar cell phone charger. Might be pretty easy depending on how you do it. Uh, if you buy a bunch of spark fun modules, you can do it without thinking. But <clears throat> that's not very interesting. A speaking digital voltmeter. I'd still like to see that done. Frequency counter, auto ranging, noise random number, a random signal generator with filtered spectrum. Ooh. For the for the digitally uh, for the DSP inclined, uh, sound animal call recorder and playback. The interesting thing about recording animal sounds is you can't use any of the compression that works with humans because the compression that works with humans, like MP3, depends on your psychoacoustics, not a bat's psychoacoustics. So you can't compress anything. <clears throat> I'd really like to see try, somebody try and build a LiDAR. Oh, I see a head turn. Does that mean you're thinking about that? Or is that just a hallucination you'd like to pursue? The latter. The latter, yeah. LiDARs are hard. Light is fast. <coughs> one light foot is one nanosecond, mas or menos. And uh, so you've got to, if you want to get one foot resolution, you've got to get one nanosecond resolution. A direct digital synthesis impedance meter. That'd be fun. Hook it to a circuit, hook it to the input output of the circuit, determine the impedance. <coughs> Complex impedance. Yeah. How about a tachometer which uses, so you, 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 yeah. I would like a tachometer that requires no modification of the device being measured. So I walk up to a motor shaft, I point something at it, I get the RPM. Another possibility, which would be really fun, would be to build a, a VGA interface for the. No, this is left for the PIC32. So, build a build a uh, uh, 640 by 480 or 320 by 240 or 160 by 120 display on VGA. Maybe powered out of one of those serial RAMs as a frame buffer. And uh, get it onto the get it onto a VGA screen. Get all the timing. The sync for VGA is really easy to generate. A cat scaring device triggered when the cat jumps on the kitchen counter. You might guess that comes from personal experience. Our cat likes to jump up on the kitchen counter, eat the flowers, and then throw up. Yeah, I'd like to keep her off the counter, but you know, it's pretty hard. Telescope mounts. A device to convince hunters not to trespass. How about something that hears a makes a loud scream when it hears a gunshot? <laughs> I think that's legal. <laughs> So, a digital hourglass. Now, what, what did I? I don't, I'm not even sure what I had in mind there. So, um, one one robot we had built a long time ago was pretty interesting. It consisted of a, on the on the whiteboard there was a servo motor at the top of the board here and here with a string going down to a magic marker. And the goal is to draw words on the screen using this quite odd, 
coordinate system. Because the, the, now thinking in terms of generalized coordinates, remember that from mechanics? So one coordinate is a great, is a circle around that pivot point. The other coordinate, natural coordinate, is a pivot around that circle. And it is not orthogonal and it is not xy. So you have to do a very interesting matrix inversion on every time step to figure out where to draw next. Can be done. You got plenty of bandwidth here. Start looking through these. Start thinking about do you want to be try and get an idea of ex sort of the, the, the genre you want. Is, do you want to do something robotic? Do you want to do something signal processing? Straight up brute force, ma force mathematical? What do you want to do? What do you what do you care about? And that's the important thing is, what do you care about? The best projects come not because you're trying to theoretically do something you, for this class, but because you do a project that addresses an interest you have outside of the class. Bicycle riding. Squash. Music. running. I've had people put, uh, make GPS computers that signal haptically on their shoulders when they should turn left and right and record the directions they went when they missed the turn and all kinds of interesting things. Not, how about non-graphical interfaces? Ways, hmm. hey I think we're done. <laughs>